This is a magic lantern. This is an old projector that for 300 years was used to put painted and photographed and lithographically copied images and thrown on the wall in front of spectators. We used it to tell stories. In 1534, Benvenuto Cellini stood in the ruins of the Colosseum. He had paid a necromancer to show him the secrets of his art. The necromancer took him into the Colosseum, under the stars and in the night air, and Benvenuto Cellini could feel the coolness of the air on his skin. And the necromancer drew a circle in chalk on the floor, as was the custom of the conjurers. And he brought out asafoetida and precious perfumes and burned them to make smoke. And he began his incantations to the monsters and the devils of the netherworld. He said, Abraxas rise and Malthus rise and come to me Moloch and Mary Hammon Samael. Come Samael, who takes away the soul of man, come Samael the severity of God. And he asked Benvenuto Cellini to call forth anyone he could think and he would bring them before him. And Benvenuto Cellini called his Sicilian mistress, Angelica. And she came before him and she moved her lips to speak but Benvenuto Cellini could hear no sounds and she drifted in and out of the ether. She was hazy and indistinct, and Benvenuto Cellini was not satisfied. Come back once more, the necromancer told. Come back once more, and I will satisfy you with anyone you can think to call forth. And Benvenuto Cellini did. He came back the next day, and again, the necromancer appeared before him under the stars in the centre of the Colosseum and he began his incantations. He cried, Abraxas rise and Malthus rise and come to me Moloch and Mary Hem and Samael. Come Samael who takes the soul of man. Come Samael, the severity of God. And Benvenuto Cellini called for his Sicilian mistress Angelica again. But she did not appear. Instead, all of the thousands of legions of monsters descended into the air around Benvenuto Cellini and around the necromancer. They were hideous amphibious creatures and serpents and giant vicious cats. And other slightly smaller vicious cats who dashed out and tried to grab Benvenuto Cellini, but he darted away from their paws. And the monsters, the monsters advanced on the circle and they tried to break into his protective, to his pr protective circle. And the monsters appeared before Benvenuto Cellini and they passed over the face of the necromancer and they spoke terrifying incantations and demands and vicious threats. They said, I am the demonic and vicious and angry Brazilian porcupine. I dart my quills at any foe who is foolish to stand before me. And the monsters advanced and continued trying to break into the chalk circle, appearing upside down above Benvenuto Cellini's head and swooping down towards him. And then appearing the correct way up, trying to attack him from all sides. I shouted one demon. 
I am Voltor Griffiths, the condor, accepting the ostrich. I am the greatest of all the birds. I can grab children upwards of 10 years of age and take them back to my nest for my chicks. And my plumage is so thick as to resist the ball from a gun. I am the Serta Crocodilus, the monster of the Nile. I too have skin so thick as to resist a bullet. My roar is terrible, and I may eat any man or beast that is foolish enough to appear before me. I am a kind of red polyp. I live in coral beds around the sea. I may be turned inside out and digest my foes with my stomach acids. <laughs> and the monsters still advanced and they still called on Benvenuto Cellini. And he and the necromancer cowered for their lives beneath these, the greatest of all the demons of hell. I, I am Testudo Serpentina, the snake tortoise. My principal food is fish, small birds. I dart my head with great fury at all of my foes, and I am extremely long-lived. Creatures of my kind are so tenacious of life that they can survive for upwards of three months with no heads! Take heart, said the necromancer, for summoning up all of his powers, the necromancer endeavored to drive back the monsters that appeared before them, summoned up his courage. He stood before them and he called out, Be gone, monstrous monsters! And Benvenuto Cellini noticed that the creatures began to rise into the night sky and drift away over the ruins of the Colosseum. The morning light rose before them. The monsters were gone. Now, William Godwin said that the necromancer on that night used a magic lantern to summon up all of the visions that Benvenuto Cellini saw. He said that when a giant demonic cat rose out of the smoke, it was just an image for a magic lantern that had tricked Benvenuto Cellini into thinking that he saw things that he did not see. Or that when giant monstrous fish flew through the air, as Benvenuto Cellini said they did in his autobiography, he said it was nothing but the images from a magic lantern thrown onto the smoke so that it appeared to float in the night air. Now, William Roscoe agrees with Godwin. He says they must have used a magic lantern, otherwise how else could they have summoned up all of the pictures and all of the images and all of the monsters that Benvenuto Cellini saw that night? Interestingly, neither of them think that Benvenuto might be making it up. They all more or less take him at his word. And David Brewster, again, essentially agrees. He says it could have been a magic lantern. He says it could have been a number of concave mirrors and all kinds of fancy chicanery that allowed the necromancer to trick Cellini into thinking that he saw devils and monsters and all variety of things. But David Brewster also says that this is funny because the magic lantern wasn't invented for another 100 years. 
100 years. Um, this is quite an interesting thing overall. Um, it tells us about these people's need to project an apparatus, a magic lantern, some kind of machine backwards into these stories in order to explain the things that were going on. It's very much of its time. David Brewster wrote an entire book where he explained various miracles and mysteries that emerged in stories from the ancient world. Um, but the magic lantern wasn't invented in 1534. It was invented in 1659 by a Dutch scientist, a very serious Dutch scientist who was in touch with Leibniz and who was in touch with Descartes and all of the greatest thinkers of his time. A man who discovered the rings of Saturn, who invented the pendulum clock, the Magic Lantern was invented, to the best of our knowledge, in 1659 by a man called Christian Hauchens. Now, as I say, Christian was a very serious scientist. We only know that he invented the Magic Lantern because it appears in his correspondence with a number of other scientists across Europe, but it appears in his notebooks where he draws a little diagram of a Magic Lantern. But he never claimed credit for it. In fact, Christian Hauchens always found the Magic Lantern just a little bit embarrassing. He was a very serious thinker. And the Magic Lantern was not very serious at all. But Christian's dad, Constantine, loved the Magic Lantern. When he was a child, Constantine had met a conjurer himself who showed him all kinds of tricks, how to use mirrors and lenses in order to make amusing occurrences appear before him. And Constantine was fascinated by this thing, and he asked his son whether he could make him a magic lantern so he could take it to the Louvre and show to the Sun King himself, Louis XIV. Christian said, okay, maybe, um, but, oh no, I've forgotten the lens combination for the magic lantern. It's lost forever. You can't possibly take it to the Louvre. And Constantine was very sad, but he was okay about it, really. And Christian thought, phew, that was, that was pretty close. Now our family won't be humiliated before the greatest minds in Europe. That's a relief. But then Christian took the magic lantern to various different workshops around Europe. He went to London and he met an instrument maker there called Richard Reeves. And when Christian left, no one knows what they talked about. No one knows what they saw, but when Christian left, Richard Reeves suddenly had a kind of magic lantern, which he could show to all kinds of people when they came in. Samuel Pepys came, and he said that he saw strange occurrences appearing on the wall of Richard Reeves' shop. He said he saw a magic lanthorn, and it was very pretty. He probably saw this picture of an octopus and a crab. And when he left, Richard Reeves continued showing it to various other entertaining people and various other brilliant scientists. And he started selling the magic lantern. And very soon the magic lantern became an interesting toy that all the scientists used. Until, like Christian Hauchens, they got bored of the magic lantern. Because the magic lantern doesn't really prove anything scientifically. It can't be used to investigate very small things like the microscope or very far away things like the telescope. It doesn't produce any new experimental knowledge. And scientists in those days were starting to think about how to produce machines to produce very new exper experimental knowledge. And the magic lantern was just an amusing toy, they thought, so they very quickly got bored. But there was a group of people who started to get interested in the magic lantern at this point. They didn't think that the magic lantern was useful as an experimental instrument either. They couldn't find things that were very far away or discover things that were very small. But they weren't interested in these things. Magic lantern was taken up 
by a group of people called the Savoyards, although they weren't all from Savoy. Or some people called them the Galantine men, although they weren't all men. They were very poor travelling entertainers. And they would buy a music box, or they train a dancing marmoset, and they travel around Europe, and they'd exhibit their curiosities and fancy tricks in fairs, and they'd sing on streets, and they'd bang on people's doors and say, would you like to see a beautiful thing that you've never seen? And the people would say, yeah, all right. And then they would take a magic lantern inside, and they would show them visions of all kinds of things. Like this monster coming out of a bottle of rum. They'd show them amusing tricks, like themselves, shooting people that didn't pay enough money for magic lantern shows, in a kind of hilarious act of extortion. They would show short sketches about distressed little men in red coats. Oh no, they would say, there's something going on. I've dropped me croissants. What could be going on? Oh, everyone's being attacked by this angry bull and they've thrown turnips in the air because they're so distressed. And this person, this very sheepish bull trainer, is all right, I'm sorry, mate. Yeah, my bad. Should have kept him over the lead or something. Um, and they tell little sketches and stories and they make people laugh. And they were sometimes amusing little pieces. Here's a little story that I learned from the Savoyard. It's a story of the Grand National. Not one of your big fancy middle class Grand Nationals, mind. This is a story of a good, down to earth, honest, village Grand National that was entered by a group of people, some horse riders, this man here, and a pig farmer called Derek. And the horse riders, even this guy with a very surprised looking horse, were pretty good at riding. But Derek the pig farmer was not very good at riding at all because he was a pig farmer and had never done it before. But he'd been convinced by the horse riders to bet all of his money on himself in the village Grand National, so he was relatively bankrupt and very, very annoyed. That's not fair, said the pig farmer. You can't expect me to race you guys in the Grand National. I'm just a pig farmer, and you guys are horse riders. How can you expect me to keep up? So, for some reason, he convinced them to do it again, and for some reason they said, yeah, all right. Maybe they thought that he wouldn't be very good. Um, maybe they thought it would be funny to do it a second time. Um, so they agreed to race again. Only this time they wouldn't race on horses, they would race on pigs. Here's one of the horse riders on a pig. Here's another horse rider on a pig. And here, oh, oh dear. Our pig farmer has fallen off his pig again. And he said, of course, guys, he invested all of his money again, by the way. He's now double bankrupt. That can happen. He said, of course, you people beat me at the Grand National. I'm just a pig farmer. And you guys are horse riders. Of course, you'd be better at riding pigs than I would. And so he fell off his pig and he lost and he became double bankrupt, as we say. Um, but then he said, let's race again. And for some reason, he's not really sure why, um, they agreed. They said, OK, fine, let's race again. And so they did. Only this time, the pig farmer went away and he found the strongest pig he could find. This guy, Colossus, the mighty pig. And he just didn't stop there. He trained him for over one week and he fed him performance enhancing drugs such as mushrooms and buckfast and he thought that the pig would be a surefire winner it was so much stronger than the other pigs and also it had gone crazy in the head a little bit and so he entered the village grand national the following friday 
and he went to saddle the pig and the race started and then the pig went completely mental and all of the people in the village had to stop the pig from going totally bananas and eating all of the truffles in the entire neighborhood truffling is the principal industry in the village without the truffling industry they would fold they would be bankrupt they would be more bankrupt than the pig farmer who is now having bet all of his money on the third grand national nearing triple bankruptcy and the mayor is very very annoyed with the pig farmer because he just destroyed their principal industry and they're all going to be poor that's a shame And there are other stories. Let's look at this guy. The Savvy Arabs would tell stories like this about a crooked baker. This man here in the white coat has been fiddling the scales. And he'd been trying to get more money for bread than was his rightful due. So, as I think is very fair, as I think everyone will agree, the baker was dragged by this monstrous demon holding a bag of money or possibly a pineapple to hell with a very nice toupee. Now this is a story called Pull Devil Pull Baker. It was very famous. This is one of the most famous slides of the era of the late 18th century and early 19th century. It was something that was repeatedly told by the Galantine men. And it's quite a moralistic story. It's got a nice message. Don't fiddle your scales, don't trick people out of money. But it's very often told in this kind of religious, pseudo-moral thing, but there is a different edge. The Saviyads, as I said, were very, very, very poor. They had different allegiances to the scientists and the richer people who would use magic lanterns at home. And so when this story is told with a moral th with a moral judgment implied it's implied against a very specifically class of people a very specific class of people because this story was told about a very real event that happened in the 1790s in the 1790s there were grain shortages across Europe and the local mills around Birmingham and around the black country in Wolverhampton and Coventry they started hoarding grain that's what this baker was doing he's hoarding grain and they tried to engineer a bread shortage when they knew they had a bread surplus. And all the poor people in the district had to go without bread because these greedy little buggers were keeping it all for themselves. And so the people ganged up. They grabbed a big sack of money or a pineapple to club the bakers around the head with. They also used sticks and some stones that they pulled up from the streets. And they, metaphorically, dragged the bakers to hell. And they did this by comprehensively rioting and setting fire to all the middle class people's houses. This is a middle class person's house and it has just been comprehensively rioted at. They smashed the windows, they set fire to the wooden beams and the whole place is getting burnt down. That's what you get when you try and engineer a food shortage. And that's why Paul Devil Paul Baker was told by all of these storytellers, because they knew where their allegiances lied. So the Saviards and the Gantee men travelled around Europe and they told stories and they sang songs and they shouted at people. And they showed the magic lantern in every corner of Europe fairs and on street corners and in people's homes. And the Magic Lantern became reasonably popular. It wasn't something that people would have in their everyday lives, but they would see it around alongside the peep shows, the dancing marmosets, the people doing funny falls and amusing voices, the shadow puppets. And the Magic Lantern was shown in other ways. At the end of the 18th century, it was integrated into the Phantasmagoria. Phantasmagoria was a magic lantern show in which they conjured up ghosts and devils and skulls, dead people, all kinds of things. 
And they staged it in an abandoned church. And they threw asafoetida and perfume on a fire to make smoke and they conjured up monsters. Only this time, people didn't necessarily think that they were real. They didn't, like Benvenuto Cellini, fear for their life. They enjoyed a little bit of amusing titillation. They saw skulls. And they saw, not long after the French Revolution, the ghosts of Robespierre and Marat emerge out of the smoke before them. They saw long, dead monarchs, like Henry Tudor, and Richard III with no lower part of his face. And they had a great big scream, and a bit of a chortle, and a jaunty, amusing laugh at all the horror of it all. And through the Phantasmagoria, through this show being taken around Europe to St. Petersburg, and Munich, and Berlin, and London, the Magic Lantern started to get a little bit more famous. And then, at the start of the 19th century, there was a man. And this man is an instrument maker. The instrument makers, if you remember back to Richard Reed, had been making the Magic Lantern for hundreds of years. And this man, Charles Blunt, an instrument maker of Cornhill in London, he was the son of a very famous instrument maker, Thomas Blunt, of the great Blunt and Nan, instrument makers to the king. And when Thomas Blunt died, Charles Blunt took up his business and started making instruments himself. But Charles Blunt was not a very good instrument maker at all. He didn't make microscopes or telescopes. He didn't make orreries. He didn't make things to learn the wonders of the universe or to study the very small to make scientific discoveries as the scientist before him has. He made tracing implements and drawing things. He sold pencils and a nice book that taught you how to draw. Blunt was a very good drawer. But his business wasn't going that well. People liked drawing, but they didn't need to buy all that many drawing implements once they had a bit of paper and some pencils. They didn't need mechanical rods to allow them to transfer between images. They didn't need all the things he was selling at all. So he thought to himself, he sat and he thought, what could I do to get people interested in buying stuff off me? And he thought and he needed something that wasn't investigative. He knew that not all people were interested in microscopes and telescopes. He wanted something wonderful, something beautiful, something that mostly upset the scientists. He needed a box that could show wondrous visions, something like the magic lantern. That's an interesting thought. He thought to himself, what if I sold Charles Blunt's completely rational magic lantern box set where people could watch like astronomy and things and they could see the wonders of the heaven. Charles Blunt really, really liked astronomy and he wanted other people to like it too. And he also knew if he sold magic lantern sliders to show crudely drawn images of Mars like this, and this here, a heavily chipped earth with a moon rotating around it. And these things, if he sold slides of this, people would come to him and they would say, Hey, hey Charles Blunt, sell me that magic lantern, will you? It's completely rational, he would say. Oh yeah, yeah, but it's really fun as well. And we would really like to see some upside down diagrams of the solar system so we could learn all about space. And learned they did. They learned all about space, but they also saw quite a lot of pictures of cats, as they always had, and would for a further 200 years. And so Charles Blunt made a completely rational and scientific magic lantern, and he marketed it, and he put it on sale, and he thought to himself, 
he thought to himself, what if we also sold like an apparatus to project the magic lantern out of the window? So when people are having like parties and things in the streets, or when there's a procession for a royal wedding or a death or something, you can project the magic lantern out of the window. That's a great idea, he thought to himself. What if also, I need mean, scale models of the universe, Charles Blunt really, really liked the universe. What if I sold scale models of the universe and people strung it from their ceiling to make a giant indoor ceiling orrery? Christian Hawkins had one of these, but not very many other people did, because most other people weren't that interested. But that didn't stop Charles Blunt. He made it anyway, and he put it on the market in a series of adverts. And then he waited for the people to come through his shop. And he waited. Why is no one coming to my shop? He thought to himself. And that's when Charles Blunt, right about the time that he was going bankrupt, that's when Charles Blunt realised that nobody really wanted a scientific and rational magic lantern, or a ceiling orrery, or some weird device to project a magic lantern out of a window. They didn't want him to connect a series of rods and draw a silhouette of their horse onto a magic lantern slide so they can look at it at home. They didn't want pentagraphic portraits of their dog. So Charles Blunt went bankrupt. But then, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, in a very different place to Charles Blunt's home in Cornhill in London, there was something going on. Birmingham! Still on fire from the riot at the end of the, 19th, of the, end of the 18th century. Birmingham was a dirty, dark old place. It was full of workshops, tinsmiths and brass founders and glass makers and painters and all kinds of people. They made buttons and buckles and gun parts and fancy toys. They made things that were shiny. They seemed to be gold, but they weren't actually gold. They were just dipped in some gold substitute and sold for more than they were worth. In Birmingham, there was all kinds of tradespeople. Like this guy. As you can see, this is a Birmingham tradesman, and he is making a magic lantern, and the horse is helping. He was really, really good at it, and because he was so well connected to a vast industrial base, the kind of which that Charles Blunt had no access to, he was able to make literally gazillions of magic lanterns, really quickly. Not just by working hard, but by using all of his mates. And so they did. And they sold their magic lanterns to other instrument makers around Birmingham. And one particular instrument maker of Birmingham. The man who commissioned this painting, Philip Carpenter of Birmingham, who in 1821 sold the improved phantasmagoria lantern. Philip Carpenter's improved phantasmagoria lantern. Wait, let's go back a second. In 1817, this man, Sir David Brewster, the public scientist, invented this the kaleidoscope. The kaleidoscope is made of a couple of brass tubes with some mirrors lodged inside and some lenses and it works sort of like a telescope except rather than looking at things to make them bigger you look at things to reflect them into beautiful psychedelic patterns. We put beads and things in there and create beautiful patterns and we have a look at them and have a nice time. We all know what a kaleidoscope is but what we might not know is that the first kaleidoscopes weren't really used to look at psychedelic beads. They were used to reflect kaleidoscopic versions of the outside world by looking at through, by looking through the kaleidoscope like a telescope, as David Brewster is doing here. Now, David Brewster found this man.
this is Philip Carpenter of Birmingham. And Philip Carpenter was very, very well connected to the Birmingham industrial landscape. He knew lots of tinsmiths and glass grinders and brass founders, people who could make tubes and people who could put all these things together. And he used his connections to create a ruddy great load of kaleidoscopes, which him and David Brewster sold and made an awful lot of money. David Brewster said that he sold 200,000 kaleidoscopes in Paris and London. Now, because David Brewster said this in a letter or something to someone, it's quite a dubious figure, but we can go with 200,000 because it's the best estimate th that we've got. And we know that it was a very, very, very lot of kaleidoscopes because everyone was talking about it in all the newspapers and pictures and things. Anyway, the kaleidoscope was very, very successful. It was the first Tamagotchi. It was the first Furby. It was the first fidget spinner thing. And pretty soon, everybody wanted a kaleidoscope. Now, a few years after the kaleidoscope, this man, Philip Carpenter, was looking for another media craze. And he thought, he thought to himself, what if we could find something, something that was very pretty, something that people were excited by, something that most scientists hated because it wasn't serious enough. And Philip Carpenter came up with an idea. Philip Carpenter came up with Philip Carpenter's improved phantasmagoria lantern, this thing here. And he thought, if we package it and sell it and do pictures of astronomy and things and animals and some kings and queens or something, we could make loads of money. It would be like totally rational. We could sell it as an educational tool and people would like to look at pictures of cats and things. And so he did. Philip Carpenter to produce magic lantern slides with animals like this little guy. Philip Carpenter to produce other animals. This majestic condor. Excluding the ostrich, the greatest of all the birds, remember. And then Philip Carpenter opened his shop and he sold a ruddy great load of magic lanterns. And everyone said, hey, Philip Carpenter, that's really clever. How did you invent that? That's amazing. And the magic lantern became really successful. And Charles Blunt went completely bankrupt, remember? Charles Blunt went bankrupt because no one bought his vision of Charles Blunt's improved rational magic lantern because he wasn't quite as well connected as Philip Carpenter. It was all very sad. And Charles Blunt left the instrument industry and didn't come back. But that's not the end of the story because Charles Blunt decided instead he would buy a magic lantern, maybe Philip Carpenter's, maybe someone else's, and he would use it to become a lecturer. And he told everybody about the planets because he really liked the planets, he really liked space, and he taught everyone. And they all came and they looked at magic lanterns and then he sold a book called The Beauty of the Heavens, which was really successful. And everybody lived happily ever after, except Philip Carpenter, who died in 1833.